It ain't the left side or the right side. Then it must be the fin side. Inside. It ain't the left side. Thank you, Solo D. Welcome to another episode of On the Fin Side here with Kat and Paul. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. Also, check out our merchandise store on thefinside.threadless.com. Paul, it is Jets Week Part 2. We've got the 4-4 four and four Dolphins against the New York Jets. Week 2, the Dolphins won 20-12, sprinting to a 20 to nothing lead at halftime before holding on for that victory in Sam Darnold's second NFL game. Injuries, Kenny Stills and Charles Harris did not practice as of the time we're recording. For the Jets, uh, Quincy Inunua and Robbie Anderson missed practice, as did nose tackle Steve McClendon. So, Paul, the last five games, Dolphins are 1-4 in four with one overtime victory over the Bears. Now, we can make the case that the Dolphins have played five pretty good opponents in the last five weeks. But we can't necessarily make that claim here if the Dolphins lose to the Jets. No, the Jets are not a great opponent right now. I mean, you listen to our segment with Jeff Lloyd, and he'll tell you this is kind of a wash year for the Jets getting ready to try to start making a run in the future because they believe they've got their guy, Sam Darnold. So, I mean, this is really a beatable Jets team. And I know Miami's reeling from injuries right now. I know they're reeling from coaching right now and this is a game they really really have to put it together I go back every year to one of the first web weekends I went to which was Tom Garfinkel's first year with the team and him addressing a room full of us and and basically saying you know what do I have to do or what do we have to do as a team to make you happy and I can't remember who it was raised their hand and said beat the Jets and he said wait so if we go two and 14 but those two wins are against the Jets, and somebody else cut them off with, we'll find a way to forgive you, but beat the Jets. So <laughs> I do remember that. Y- yeah, that, you it have is that to do big. It. I mean, and this is a big game in the season, too, because I keep lowering the bar week by week. You know, I, with Dolphins, a- after they lost to the Bengals, I thought, okay, I know how this is going to go. They're going to fall back. Then they beat the Bears and get to four and two. I say, okay, they really got to beat the Lions, and they didn't. And then I say, okay, they've really got to beat the Texans. They can't go 500 in the midpoint, and they didn't. But if they beat the Jets here and go to 5-4, and four, then I can see a pathway for the Dolphins to win four more games. They've got two games against the Bills. They've got a game against the Colts. They've got a game against the Jaguars at home. That could be nine wins right there. And if they don't get nine wins there, then I don't really see a reason we should talk about the Dolphins being successful in the second half of the year anyway. Yeah, I mean, it, it's this is going to be a, a, a prove-it game for Miami a little bit. On top of that, next week Miami travels to Green Bay, which I'm expecting Brock Osweiler starts again in that game. I don't think we see Tannehill till after the bye week. They're supposed to be resting his shoulder a bit. I know he's resumed throwing a little bit, but I I think he sits again next week. So that'll be a tough matchup against Aaron Rodgers in the pack. But from there, if you can come out of these next two games with at least one win, which presumably that would be against the Jets, if so, and get a healthy Tannehill back after the bye week, get a healthy Kenny Stills back here in the next couple of weeks. You know, Kenny, I'd rather he rest right now anyway. Brock can't hit any of the routes Kenny runs. It's, it's just a simple fact. I mean, and and really, you get those two back and healthy. I think Miami could do some stuff down the stretch, especially if we, they get a motivated Parker again and keep Jakeem Grant on the field as much as possible with a little bit of Amadola peppered in. Maybe the offense is not great right now with Osweiler. And Osweiler is what he is, and we've started to see that over the last five or six quarters for the Dolphins. But I will say this, over the last three games – Dolphins with Osweiler quarterback have put up 76 points, over 25 points a game. And I think that the skill positions at running back and receiver have done well. I think the offensive line, especially with Laramie Tunzel at left tackle, has blocked much better than we thought. They've overachieved a lot. So I think the Dolphins are going to have an opportunity here to move the ball a little bit against this Jets defense. Looking at the defensive side of the ball, it's a completely different story. I mean, again, I, I hate to go back to this, but I something I tweeted out, and I think I said on our show on Sunday night, if I wasn't so blind pissed off that I forgot it, 
that over the last 11 quarters, opposing quarterbacks have a rating against the Dolphins of 145.3. Running backs have an average of 6.46 yards a carry, and the Dolphins can't seem to stop anybody on defense. Then again, they have played good offenses, but Paul, this week, Against the Jets, this is not a team that scores a lot. This is a team with a lot of injuries on the offensive side of the ball. They better be able to make some headway on defense this week. Yeah, the defense is going to be really critically reliant upon Cam Wake and Robert Quinn. If those two can remember how to rush a passer again, which we haven't seen in a bit here, that makes the secondary better. I, I'm not going to ding the secondary for the passer opposing passer rating because there's been no semblance of a pass rush. And when that happens, the quarterback's got all day to throw, which gives receivers all day to get open. There's no one in the history of the NFL that's going to sit there and cover receivers on a regular basis for 15 seconds. I mean, it's just not a thing. And so I can't fault them. And a lot of the passes, too, have been to running backs underneath and to tight ends, which we've struggled a bit in coverage, which – Perennially, no matter what Miami has in the field, for some reason, tight ends and running backs in the receiving game have always killed, no matter who's on the defense, et cetera. So hopefully Matt Burke can figure out how to tighten that ship up. I don't count on Matt Burke doing that, but at least if Miami can rediscover the pass rush, it starts to negate a lot of things the teams have been doing against them. And Sam Darnold last game against the Dolphins was 25 for 41, 335 yards a touchdown, a couple of interceptions. The more amazing thing, though, is of those 25 passes Darnold completed, 19 of them were to Bilal Powell, Robbie Anderson, Quincy Inunua, and Terrell Pryor. And I bring that up because in this game, Bilal Powell is on injured reserve. Quincy Inunua is iffy. Robbie Anderson is iffy for the game. Terrell Pryor was cut and is now with the Buffalo Bills. So, they're going to really have to find other weapons in this game, and it's going to probably be in the shape of veteran wide receiver Jermaine Curse, who right now on the team, if Anderson and, and Nunwa don't play, leads the team with 195 yards. And then after that, you've got DeAndre Burnett, who is Sam Darnold's number one receiver last year at USC, who went undrafted, who was their leader last year our last week at wide receiver. Someone else to keep an eye on is uh, former ta- uh, Canes tight end, Chris Herndon, who has three touchdowns over the last couple of weeks. But I'll tell you what, Paul, here's what I'm going to say right now. Given the matchups on paper, the Dolphins have as angry as I am at, at Matt Burke right now, if the Dolphins lose a 28 to 24 game where Sam Darnold completes 70% of his passes, throws for three or four touchdowns, does Matt Burke get fired after the game? It's a thought. I mean, especially if, you know, you've got Minka Fitzpatrick, who has, I believe, the best in the league passer rating against as far as defensive performance. And then you've got TJ McDonald out there, who I believe is allowing a quarterback rating of something like 105 for passes thrown in his area. And he hasn't been anything in, in run support either the past few weeks. So you've got you know, this guy that's been phenomenal in run support and has the lowest passer rating allowed in it to re- or re- uh, completion percentage allowed, I believe, to receivers that he's covering, sitting there in the wings. And you still haven't put him in over TJ McDonald. And I'm willing to bet if Sam Darnold has a big day, it's got to go through TJ. That's the weak leak in the secondary. That's the one that's been allowing a lot this year. So I think it goes through TJ. And if he's still got TJ out there the entire second half with Minka sitting on the bench periodically, uh, I think it's a no-brainer at that point in time. I I could not agree more. And Minka Fitzpatrick played 52% of defensive snaps last week as the Dolphins are just getting run off the field. It's a level of stupidity that I, I don't even think I can fathom at this point. Minka is way better at cornerback then Bobby McCain is on the boundary, at which point you can shove Bobby McCain into the slot to play more often. He is astronomically better than TJ McDonald is at anything. So I don't understand how you don't get this guy on the field more. Vincent Taylor, who is unfortunately now an injured reserve, he saw his snaps get cut when he was playing at his best. So I don't quite understand this. But to circle back on the defensive side of the ball, Paul, yeah, I, th- I agree with you. I think the point here and the 
biggest thing in this game is Robert Quinn and Cameron Wake getting back on track, getting back in the sack column, because I remember in week two when they went against Kelvin Beecham and Brandon Shell, the Jets tackles, they had a great day and it led to that shutout in the first quarter or first half against the Jets. Yeah, I agree. And one other element I just want to bring up too that could be very critical in this in this game here is Matt Hawk. Let's face it, sidearm Sasquatch is going to put Miami in some punting situations. I, I don't think anybody can disagree with that. If Matt Hawk can pin the rookie with his ass in the end zone, I think that could be a huge, huge boon in what could potentially be a close game. And you know, there's no better way to get back in the pass rush column than, than, than taking Darnold out in the end zone. So, you know, it, it's Matt Hawk pinning the Jets deep. They're not a team that's built to play with their ass, their ass in the end zone. They're not. And so that could position Miami very well in this game if Matt Hawk can have the game that he seems to be t- trending back towards. Yeah, and Matt Hawk had an MVP-type game against the Jets last time. Nobody was more responsible for the Jets being shut out in the first half than Matt Hawk against the Jets last time. And yet Sam Darnold too is somebody I think is more prone to be sacked, especially against the, that outside pass rush. He likes to, he's a young guy, likes to stand in the pocket, likes to be that gunslinger. That's why the Dolphins were able to get him to the ground three times last, uh, last contest and why he threw two interceptions. The Dolphins are going to need something like that again, because they have not been getting hardly any sacks. I mean, one sack in the last three games, and they have not been forcing those turnovers like they were in the first several weeks. Paul, I'm going to go first with my prediction in this game. I do think the Dolphins get back on track. I think they pull this out. I think the defense has a better performance here, gets more pressure on the quarterback. I think the Darnold and the Jets offense in comparison to what they've seen over the last five weeks from the Patriots and Bengals and Lions and Bears and Texans, I think they're going to be more ready to play and, and get back on track at home. I'm going to go with the Dolphins 23 to 13. I'm going to go. I think Miami actually generates three or four turnovers in this one. Uh, the more I think about it, the more I can see it. And for me, I think that leads to what shouldn't be as close of a win as I, I'm going to predict here. But I think it, it ends up being close because I think sidearm Sasquatch there stalls at times. But given that, I still think Miami pulls this off 28 to 20 in this one. And that will do it for our breakdown of the Jets Miami Dolphins matchup as we approach week nine. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, iHeartRadio, and on Spotify. And be sure to check out our segment as well with Jeff L.J. Lloyd as we take a look at the opposing sideline of the New York Jets. Also, follow us, uh, follow our merchandise store, too, on thefinside.threadless.com. We've got a lot of great stuff going on over there. And if it's not on the right side and it's not on the left side, it is on the fin side. Solo D, take us home. It ain't the left side or the right side. And it must be the fin side. side. It ain't the left side, left side or the right, right side. side. And it must be the fin side. Left. Listen, Dolphins fans across the land all tuning in to see what Brian Cat and Paul about.